Yo, let's go. Let's do this. All right, what's up, y'all? Some popping on there. Some popping on my speaker. All right, what's up, y'all? All right, can you see me? What's up? Shout out to everybody out there. Shout out to all the analyzers out there. Let me know if you can see me. Let me know if you can hear me. If I'm good, I'm trying to get some tech worked out. So we should be good. Uh, okay, so today. Today, um, let's see. Shout out to Expo, Crispy, Jeff, Natsky, ADH, everybody in the chat. Um, let's see. Okay, so today uh, we are working on. Uh, thank you, David. Appreciate you, buddy. All right, so today we're working on. Um, we're talking about some war literature. Okay, let me know if you can hear me too. If my audio is okay, because I've been having some boomer tech problems. What's up, Ellie? Um, so. Yeah, we're going to be talking about war literature today uh, because it's relevant, obviously. And um, we're not going to be talking about anything, um, any contemporary war literature, anything from um, the year 2022. Obviously, we're going to be going back into some of the old classics. And I think today is going to be – thank you again, David. Appreciate you. So today um, I added a couple of things that I wanted to talk about today um, since I put this up. And we were just going to do W H. I'm sorry, um, Wilfred Owen, and um, and Yates. We're going to go back to a Yates poem. Um, <clears throat> but I was um, thinking about it, and I went back in a couple of my old books, and uh, I think we're going to add a couple of things here. We're going to talk about um, a little bit about the the, the Iliad, maybe the Aeneid, um, some of the verse in there, and definitely some Ezra Pound. So today, what I'm going to be um, going from is an old book of mine that I got. Um, when I was in grad school in Belfast um, at Queens. And so today, again, um, you know, if you're watching this, uh, this is going to be basically an analysis of war poetry, what um, some good examples of war poetry um, and its relevance and the style of the language and uh, some of the uh, significance of the form and content. Um, to produce meaning and what what poetry is in those terms, why there's war, why there's war literature in the first place. And, um, you know, this is kind of a for a lot of people, this will be going back to um, I don't know if it'll be going back to high school. I think more of this. Is, this is more of a uh, maybe an undergrad um, uh, level analysis, um, probably uh, more of a grad school level analysis in terms of some of the literature that we're reading. I'm not saying we're going to be doing anything. Um, we're not going to be, you know, doing uh, be doing PhD level stuff here, uh, but we'll be we will be covering some grad school level um, sources and talking about some of the dynamics of the poem. So we're going to start off. Um, I think we'll start off with reading um, W. H. Auden and his poem um, "Dulce et Decorum Est" because um, this is one of the one of the great poems, um, one of the great war poems. And um, I keep saying W.H. Auden, um, I think, but I mean to say Wilfred Owen. So forgive me if I do that. In the last stream with Jerry, shout out, Exposing Powerful Lies, uh, sub to him. Uh, my good buddy, um, Jerry, I kept I realized after the stream was over, I kept saying Joseph Campbell instead of Joseph Conrad. And I meant Joseph Conrad, um, Heart of Darkness. So that was a mistake. Um, but yeah, so if I, if I, if I say, uh, W H Auden is cause W H Auden is on my mind. And what I mean is, um, Wilford Owen. So we're going to first cover, um, Wilford Owen's Dulce at Decorum Est. And, um, you probably read this, uh, you probably did read this when you were in high school. Um, but we're going to go back and cover it. And this is from a, just a good book that I got when I was um, living in Belfast and it's, um, just a sort of an anthology of war poetry by John Stallworthy. And um, so let's get started. This is Dulce de Cormas by Wilfred Owen. This poem is a pretty pure World War I, great war poem. And again, I'll reiterate this again. We're not going to talk much about the lives of the poets in terms of the literature. We're just going to cover 
as much as we can, we're going to cover the literature itself and talk about the words and, and um, what they give us. Right. So, um, but that, that being, but it's like the meme, right? All of this, but, uh, but that being said, it is interesting to note that, um, that Wilfred Owen uh, was a soldier um, in World War One. He was an Englishman and he died um, before the, the end of the war. So it makes this poem kind of particularly poignant. And thank you for dropping the links, uh, Kangs out there. Jeff, thank you for, um, uh, yeah, dropping my uh, Insta link. Follow me on Instagram. Um, share the stream. You guys, please put comments after the stream is over. Like ADH um, pointed out, a devotional heart in her stream. Yeah, put some comments um, at the end because it'll help me. Um, it'll help us get on the, um, you know, into wider circulation. Maybe we can, um, you know, get start building our audience here a little bit, um, even though we've been going for a week, right? Um, and also, please um, see my uh, Cash App and um, PayPal links in there. And obviously, I haven't worked up to Streamlabs yet. I got to get there. Uh, when I do, you'll be able to drop comments and then I can answer questions and comments as we go. But until then, if you do drop a fat cash app or whatever, I can see it come through in real time. And if you got a question or comment, I can answer it. So that would be great. Thank you. Appreciate y'all. All right. So here we go. This is a uh, Dulce Decorum asked by Wilfred Owen. Okay. So he says, <clears throat> bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock need, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge till on the haunting flares, we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light is under a green sea. I saw him drowning in all my dreams before my helpless sight. He plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin, if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. The old lie. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. All right. So that is the poem. I just wanted to read the whole the whole poem first for you. Um, again, it's says Dulce et decorum est by Wilfred Owen. I just wanted to read the whole poem. It's three stanzas. It's a three stanza poem. Uh, because... Uh, this poem deserves to be read uh, all in one without breaking it up before we start to analyze, before we start to analyze it. This is a, a really, really, um, this is a great poem. This, this poem um, gives me chills when I read it uh, because the language is so strong. It's so, it's so true. Um, and, you know, we, we, this is a lyric poem, but we go through a kind of a, a, a brief, a uh, horrid, vile, violent journey with the speaker here. And listen to some of the language. So first of all, just talking about the form of the poem, it's a, it's a three stanza poem and it's broken up into three stanzas into sections. Yes. Good question for us. Non-Latin speakers. Can you translate says David Atkinson? Uh, I'll put that up there. Yes. So that's a great question. So um, Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori means uh, loosely translated, it is good and right to die for one's country. This is a, a Roman martial uh, motto, right? And this is, I mean, look, this is still true today in terms of what we hear. And, and the general consists, I mean, look at the world right now. I'm going to try not to mention those things specifically just, just so we don't get bogged down into it. 
But you hear this from all sides. You hear this from the media, especially from the same media that's been telling us for years that first, remember, there were um, W.M. McDee's in uh, a certain place in the Middle East. Right. They pushed this for a long time. And then it's no, they aren't there. Right. And now we know they weren't there. We know that, that that they were never there. And now we get all of a sudden again, you know, it was, oh, war's bad, all this stuff. And all of a sudden it's all in. It's all in on the on the war, right? Um, go on, go ahead, send everybody over there. Send your send your kids over there. Um, I'll gladly give you an AK, is what they say. Right. I didn't mean to rhyme there. Um, but uh, but what Wilfred Owen here is saying, right? He this is ironic, yes. Um, and actually, we're gonna we're gonna deal with a poem by Ezra Pound uh, in a minute that's going to put this to rest. Um, and again, we're gonna be talking about the horrors of war, you know, as we know them. I mean, if you're watching this and you know you you know these things firsthand, forgive me. We're talking about this from a um, you know just a regular dude and from a literary perspective here um, and what he says. Okay. So, so yes, Dulce at decorum asked. It's good and sweet. Dulce, right? The dulcet tones, the sweet tones. Um, that's right, Jeff. The horror. The horror. So he starts off and he says, bent double like old beggars under sacks, right? So we immediately, the image here is uh, we picture – you know, soldiers, World War One, walking along the trench lines and they've got their heavy rucksacks on or their heavy, you know, their the packs and they're bent over. Yes, they are. They're under the weight, under the literal weight of their packs, but also under the figurative weight of the war um, in terms of their soul and what they've had to endure. He says, knock need. So, again, we get the we get the cacophonous sounds we get the alliteration in the poem which is supposed to indicate to us that this is a hard time there's nothing sweet there's nothing um he's remember he's showing us so great so just a side note here um we all usually we hear from uh picasso right the painter um you know uh that great artists uh bad artists borrow great artists steal this is also an ezra pound and it's t.s Eliot said this about literature specifically that you know Mediocre artists or bad artists will borrow, right? Um, but the great artists will steal. And um, what we mean by that is that if something has been said, the best it can be said, you'll just take it, right? We will read the inference and we'll get the illusions. That's what T.S. Eliot's all about. Um, but in this one, um, uh, that ties in, by the way, with um, with the idea of great poetry – will show great literature will show you it won't tell you so that kind of ties in with um the the nature of this whole channel which is um i'm not trying to be didactic right or talk at you or like teach anyone we're all grown people here um we all have brains and we all you know we're we're all intelligent and so i'm just simply discussing the literature and you can take from it uh what you will um but in terms of the words themselves on the page, we want to be shown the images. We don't want to be told the images. We don't want exposition. We want to see the exact thing. And that's what he does from the beginning. That's also why bent double like old beggars under sacks. This is pentameter, just like Shakespeare. So remember, again, we get the idea of the metrical line. We get a 10 syllable line, which is the standard in English poetry um, in We'll see that in Homer, we get the hexameter, but here we get the pentameter. It's called pentameter again, because penta means five, and there are five poetic feet in the line. Each foot is divided into two syllables. Uh, to define our terms, a syllable is basically the every time our mouth changes shape with a vowel sound. But notice this is an inversion of the normal iambic pentameter. Iambic pentameter is where the words are in a in an unstressed, stressed, uh, rhythmic pattern. Here we start off just like the the Weird Sisters, the witches in Macbeth, with trochaic, which means it's inverted because he says bent, right? It starts off with the hard bent, 
So the reason he's starting off hard is because we're thrown right into the action. We're thrown right into the war. Knock need. That's actually um, uh, what's not Pyrrhic, but um, uh, spondaic, which is like stress, stressed. He says, knock need, coughing like hags. Notice hags. Is that That's kind of <laughs> almost a Macbeth reference. They're coughing, right, because they're in war and they're dealing with chemical attacks and they're cold and tired and hungry and dirty. We cursed through sludge. We can see that he's presenting us with the sludge and the mud of the trenches, right? Uh, today, I saw images from the thing that's going on right now. And it was a bunch of, you know, um, it was a bunch of Russian soldiers um, at a checkpoint and then other ones um, walking down um, a trench, uh, not a trench line, uh, a, a road. And it's amazing because as much as things change, they stay the same. And in this picture could have been from World War One. I. I mean, it, the uniforms were different. The weapons were different, but it was the same in terms of the sludge. And the why is war always muddy, right? Why does it always seem muddy and sludgy and, and overcast and dark? Uh, well, we, you know, a rhetorical question. Um, Till on the haunting flares, we turned our back. So they see flares, right? They see flares in the back. And toward our distant rest began to trudge. So notice that, again, we get the, we get a rhyme scheme here. So why is there a rhyme scheme? Why is there a specific rhythm and meter? Because the speaker here is saying that there is form. There is form. There is order, right? There's order in the world even in the war. So the chaos is going to come later in terms of the content. Remember, form plus content equals meaning, right? So the form shows us that, number one, there's form in terms of the lines of soldiers walking. There's form in terms of the way they are ordered. Um, they receive their orders. Uh, they're ordered in terms of uh, divisions of men. They're ordered in terms of in, in the trench itself, what they, their materials that they have. And it's ordered in terms of there, there are sides, right? And there, there are, there is a hierarchy. We're going to see later that the chaos comes, especially in the second stanza with the content in terms of what they have to endure within this order. He says, um, men, this is my favorite line, probably in the whole poem, because we've had four lines and we've had uh, one, four lines, one long sentence, right? Remember lines of verse, lines of poetry are not sentences. They're not always sentences. Um, the sentence can be a number of lines. And interestingly enough, what does verse mean? Verse means to turn. So that's why the line, there are line breaks because we go from one line to the next, one to line to the next. And he says, men marched asleep. That's a three word sentence. Um, what this indicates is that they are they are asleep in terms of, yes, they're tired and they've been marching for a long time and they're having to endure war. But it's also kind of foreshadowing for the fact that there's death, right? They're walking into the big sleep. Um, or what does Shakespeare say? Um, uh, the undiscovered tra uh, country from which no traveler returns. Many had lost their boots but limped on bloodshot. Bloodshot is so strong here. That's it's almost a kenning. A kenning is a, uh, uh, a, a not a, it's not a kenning. It's a, um, what's the word? It, it, we're talking about Anglo-Saxon literature and Beowulf. And this is where you have an expression um, where you kind of separate it into two words with a dash in the middle, not a conceit. Um, anyway, I can't think of it right now, but bloodshot is strong. It's violent. It's cacophonous. Right. And he's saying he's comparing the men, obviously, to beasts. Right. They've been shod like like horses. He says all went lame. All blind because why? Because of the flares in the background and the flares, the flares indicate. Let me take that one off. Uh, the flares indicate the gas attack. Right. Um, he says drunk with fatigue. Deaf. Even do the hoots of tired outstrip five nines that drop behind. The word hoot here is weird. Um, it rhymes with the word boots in that in line five. But the hoot here is the literal sound, right? This is onomatopoeia. This is the literal sound of the five nines, which are the, the weapons being fired. Um, and they're tired and outstripped. So the, even the weapons 
sort of mirror the the men themselves. Then he goes into an, an actual, it's almost like he's going into dialogue here. He's speaking. This speaker is in the war, right? He's This is present tense. He's not talking about the war in the past tense. He's talking about at the time. We're with him. He says, gas, gas, quick, boys. So they're, they, they got to get down. They got to put on their masks. An ecstasy of fumbling. What an interesting way to phrase this, right? It's an ecstasy of fumbling. You can picture the men all looking through their equipment, trying to find their gas mask, trying to, you know, get down, trying to do whatever they have to do to avoid the gas. But why is it an ecstasy? It's ecstatic because they're, they, they're at the peak, right? This is a, a climactic moment. It's a climax because we see the flares in the background up in the sky. We see um, the weapons being fired, things being shot out. And we see um, the men, you know, in this moment of excitement, right? He says, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. That's a great line. See, so the thing about, you know, about verse, especially about rhyming verse, is that, you know, up to, getting to this point, which is, you know, early 20th century, Rhymed verse sort of begins for one reason it becomes it ends up becoming free verse is because the rhymes are tired. They are tired rhymes. There aren't there. Are, English is a big language, but there are only so many words that can rhyme. If you're writing in Italian, you can like endlessly rhyme because all the rhyme, the words rhyme with each other. Right. But in English, that's sort of difficult and it becomes an exercise in futility. It's like an exercise in, oh, I'm trying to find a word. So I just rhyme anything. But here. He's, he, he rhymes time and lime. Why is it a man in fire or lime? Because all of a sudden he looks down and one of the guys has been struck. He's breathed in the mustard gas. The lime is the yellowish green fog, the death fog that flows into the, into the trench. And the man is, it says he's floundering because interestingly, the floundering is an aquatic image, right? This guy is in a sea of green and yellowish fog, almost like an ocean of death. This reminds me again of Macbeth, right? Where we, I didn't mean to rhyme Macbeth and death there. Um, but this is like Macbeth where he says, um, all wash, uh, uh, wash my hands. Great. Um, will the multitude in seas incarnadine, right? They have, they have made they have made the trench incarnadine. They have they have um I'm sorry, incarnadine reddened it. They he wants to all Neptune's great ocean, it's green. So the comparison here is that he's lost in a green ocean of death, right? The lime, which is the gas. Dim through misty panes and thick green light. The panes are the the eye, the eye window, the little windows on the gas mask, right? The glass. Um, which are misting up with his own breath, but also the word pain is an obvious pun here, right? Because he's in pain, P-A-I-N. As under a green sea, I saw him drowning, he says. How awful is it that in chemical warfare, right, the, the mustard gas goes, it it lands near the trench and it flows into the trench and it's like this vaporous, foggy death. And it looks it probably looks a combination of, you know, both almost mystical, right? Um, and and also terrifying, terrible, right? This is literal death. And if you breathe it, well, we'll see what happens when you breathe it. He says, "Good point, Jeff. Paths of Glory breakdown coming. Yeah, that would be a great one. Um, that would be that would be a good one. You know, Kubrick's Paths of Glory would be awesome because it it mirrors this in many ways." In all my dreams, this is this is poignant here. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. He plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. He why does he plunge? He plunges because he's he's jumping at the speaker here, but he's plunging also because again, this water image. It's like he's falling into the sea. And the the guttering. And the choking and the drowning here is so true. It's the words here reflect reality in a way that great, only great literature can do. Um, and he says in the third stanza, the third stanza is a, 
almost a personal recollection of what he has just lived through. Now he's, he's commenting on it, right? He gave us, he gave us the thing. Then he gave us the, the images themselves. And now he's, he's discussing it, but we can tell that he's not discussing the rest of the poem and the images like from a far off distant place or from a time that's, you know, far removed. He's actually discussing the images in that they just happened. He says, if in some smothering dreams, you too. So he's talking to you. He's talking to us. Right. If you, he says you two could pace, why are they smothering? Because the guy's been smothered. And what happens, we all know this probably, but what happens when you're struck with mustard gas is you breathe it in, your lungs fill with blood and you drown in your own blood. Right. Um, what a, what a, what a, in, in, it's inhuman. Yes. You two could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in. Um, earlier today, I was reading, um, I was reading from Daniel Defoe's Diary of the Plague Year. And uh, we all know that, bring out your dead. Bring out your dead, right? And we know that from, actually, we know it from Jim Morrison, right? Um, and from The Doors and their like great New York live set where they sang the end. And Jim did that for about five minutes beforehand, ringing a bell. But this is an actual medieval. We also know it from Monty Python, obviously. I'm not dead yet. Um, but they have a wagon. They have a death wagon. And they are flinging their friend into this wagon. And watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's sick of sin. Right? Like a devil's sick of sin. Why is he a devil? He's a devil because he's in war. He is bent on killing. But he's also made ugly by death. And he's, it's almost, this image is saying he's sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs because the lungs are bleeding, right? Obscene, what a great line, obscene as cancer. Uh, that reminds me of Apocalypse Now, right? Um, when Kurtz is recording his last um, messages there in his compound, uh, they won't let us write the word fuck on the airplanes because it's obscene. Right, the irony, the the cruel irony of war. They won't let you write cuss words on the bombs because it's obscene. Meanwhile, the bomb is headed right for a wedding or whatever. Right, um, it's a death machine. He says, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud. Notice the cacophonous alliteration there: cancer and cud. Cud also in that line ties back to the very beginning. Right in the first stanza, the idea of the horse right? The horse chewing its cud. Um, uh, we get the, let's see, we get the blood shod, right? And then we get the wagon again. That's another um, equine image of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, he's talking to us. He's talking to us, the reader. It's like he's writing to a a friend in the war or he's writing to somebody, you know, outside of the war, but he's really writing to us. He's telling us, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. Now, if only people would listen to this, right? If only people would listen to this. Yes, the old lie. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, right? <laughs> in other words, in other words, what's he saying here? He's saying it's a lie. War is a lie. Yes, it's a lie. And it's not a lie because of the guy fighting in it. It's not a lie because of, you know, because of us. It's a lie on the one hand because of the people putting you there and their intentions and their insidious, nefarious, vile, evil intentions where they use people like pawns. I mean, why do you think there's a chessboard with pawns, right? Um, Shakespeare says in King Lear, um, he says, um, what's this line? Um, uh, we are but playthings to the gods. They kill us for their sport. Right. And that's how the speaker here feels. Yes. He's, he's, it's like he's, he's in this trench. He's in this war. He's been put here for nothing in, in the war for nothing um, to gain an inch every day. 
um, only to be thrown away like fodder and to watch his friends die for what, right? Now, again, I'm not making a judgment or a statement on war itself in terms of the larger aspect um, or the idea of a righteous war, right? Um, or a war of defense for us. But, but I am saying that this is what the speaker here is saying, right? This is what, this is a, this is um, a, a, a very strong statement. Um, it's not necessary. I mean, look, I don't want to just say this is an anti-war poem. Okay. That kind of diminishes the poem. This is a war talking about the realities, uh, a poem talking about the realities of war. Um, and let's go on from here to, um, let's see, let's, let's discuss next uh, Ezra Pound's Hugh Selwyn Moberly. Um, Ezra Pound, uh, one of the, most important poets. Um, one of them, he was known as a kingmaker. I'm not bragging, folks. Um, yeah, I'm not bragging, folks. <laughs> um, these people, the most ancient Egyptian rituals covered in filth. Um, they, uh, Ezra Pound is known as the kingmaker, uh, because he is responsible for making the careers of so many other artists. Um, for instance, um, uh, let's see, he was born in 1885, I think. Um, he was put in a cage during World War II because he was broadcasting from Italy. He was uh, pro Mussolini, um, so to speak, I guess. And he was put, he was broadcasting from there. The Americans found him, put him in a cage. He took a 10 year vow of silence after that. He had a, a long and varied life. Um, he was definitely connected to powerful people. He helped fund Poetry Magazine in Chicago in the early 20th century. He basically was single handedly responsible for um, free verse, um, and was a proponent of the ideas of modernity. Say what you will about that. Right. Um, and I would say that not to say that the ideas of modernity are good. <laughs> I mean, look, look at, look at us. Right. But I would say that he was an, he was a proponent of revolutionizing literature, um, to keep up with the modern world. And he actually, not, not only to keep up, but he really started a lot of this stuff. Um, and we can see that in some of his poems, the one we're about to read, that his poems really like as like T.S. Eliot, he made he edited T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Um, he taught at Hemingway. Basically, he didn't teach Hemingway how to write, but he lived in Paris at, at the same time as Hemingway, and Hemingway used him as an editor. There's a story about him, uh, Ezra Pound, teaching Hemingway to write in exchange for Hemingway teaching him how to box. Um, he helped edit James Joyce. He knew, Jan you know, he, he knew James Joyce. Um, uh, and he, he was in touch with a lot of people and really got them started um, and published. And his poems are fragmentary in nature because they reflect the fragmentary nature of modernity, especially post-World War I, right? Where the world has been broken up. People have lost their psyches uh, and their their sort of personalities and their souls feel shattered. You have the lost generation. You have the the crazy, weird degeneracy of of modern art. Um, and I think that, um, you know, this this poem especially uh, really is a prime example of that. It's called Hugh Sel. It's from his epic poem, Hugh Selwyn Moberly. And this is one of the most famous just brief sections of it. So I'm just going to read this again. This is Ezra Pound. He says, uh, this is from Hugh Selwyn Moberly. He says, these fought in any case and some believing pro domo in any case, some quick to arm, some for adventure, some for fear of weakness, some for fear of censure, some for love of slaughter in imagination, learning later, some in fear, learning love of slaughter, died some pro patria, Non dulce, non at decor, walked I deep in hell, believing in old men's lies, then unbelieving came home, home to a lie, home to many deceits, home to old lies and new infamy, usury age old and age thick and liars in public places, daring as never before, wastage as never before, young blood and high blood, fair cheeks and fine bodies, fortitude as never before. Frankness as never before, delusions as never told in the old days, hysterias, trench confessions, laughter out of dead bellies. There died a myriad, and of the best among them, 
for an old bitch gone in the teeth for a botched civilization. Charm, smiling at the good mouth, quick eyes gone under earth's lid. For two gross of broken statues, for a few thousand battered books. Um, that poem is not hard to understand, I think, um, just in terms of its tone. Uh, it's, ex it's, it's extreme, right? Um, he, Pound is amazing because this is like circa World War I. Listen to his language. It's so, it is so strong and it is so relevant. This poem could be written right now, right? Especially the walked eye deep in hell, believing in old men's lies. Who do you think he's talking about here? Then unbelieving came home, home to a lie. Right? What do we see every time? We're living here. <laughs> We're told something's going on. We're told all this stuff. Um, see, I would see... Um, the B-A-B-I-E-S in incubators lies, right? Look at uh, Poland Cowell's um, testimony, right? Before the Gulf War. Look at, look at now, right? Lie after lie for the old, the old, the old meaning both in age and also the ancient, right? In terms of the power structure, it's a continuous lie where you're used like fodder. And the what's really striking about this poem is look at the um, the reasons that he gives for people going to war in the first place. Now, this is pretty, it's interesting because World War I was the first truly mechanized war, right? The tank, the airplane, the gas. Um, and what is interesting about this is that prior to World War I, um, when, especially in America, right? Remember we joined the war late, um, just like we did in World War II, but when people heard about the war, especially here, their idea, their idea of the war was, um, something gallant, right? They imagined because they, because of the books they'd read and because of the, you know, the adventure novels and the stories and the tales, they, they imagined like, you know, riding into glory in the sunset in, you know, the civil war or, um, you know, like the rough riders or riding in the old West or, you know, they imagined gallant knights. And so th they all went and signed up. They all signed up, right. An entire class of uh, VMI Virginia military Institute was annihilated. Uh, the battle of the Psalm had, you know, more people died at like the initial assault of the inv invasion at the battle of the Psalm than the entire three previous wars that America had fought in one battle, right? So you imagine why these people are quick to arm. They thought when World War I was going to come, they were going to do the same thing. And it turned out to be hell. It was hell on earth. We see this now. Oh, send your sons and daughters. Send your sons and daughters over there to that place over there in, you know, Eastern Europe. Give them a, give them a weapon. You know, we're going to beat these Ruskies, <clears throat> Right? Man, come on. Some quick to arm, right? Some for adventure. Some for fear of weakness. They don't want to, they don't want to seem weak. Some for fear. This one's pretty striking. Some for fear of censure. Right? What does that mean? Well, hello. That to me is like virtue signaling, right? Uh, do this, otherwise, people will send they will censor you, they will censure you. You won't be a man. You won't be, you'll be unperson if you're not, if you don't put that flag in your profile pic, right? Um, some for love of slaughter, of course, right? In imagination, in, in, I said that very, in imagination, imagination, in imagination, learning later, some in fear, learning love of slaughter died some, right? And then he cancels out the Roman martial idea, which Owen talked about, he says, pro patria, non dulce, non et decor. They didn't die this way, right? They didn't die bravely, brilliantly, um, you know, covered, draped in glory and a flag. They died in absolute tear, uh, terror, agony, and fear at the bottom of a trench filled with mud, blood, and water where they choked on... Um, 
on the brains and body parts and filth of human beings living in the same place, covered in this thing with trench foot and trench mouth diseased, uh, mixed in with some mustard gas. Sounds wonderful, right? Um, I like at the end, uh, the, obviously there's, there died a myriad, right? The old bitch gone in the teeth for a botched civilization. Uh, one interesting part that I, I, I forgot about here is when he says hysteria, trench confessions and laughter out of dead bellies. Well, what does that mean? Laughter out of dead bellies. I think that laughter out of dead bellies to me, it reminds me of, I think what he's saying here is particularly, this is why Pound is brilliant as a poet because because what he's saying here is that notice the image, the laughter out of dead bellies is a reference to partly to um, Julius Caesar, maybe not a conscious, a conscious reference, but in Julius Caesar, uh, Mark Antony is giving his funeral oration for Caesar. And he says um, something about the dagger wounds like dumb mouths. Um, and what he's, what he's saying here is that the, the, de- the wounds that uh, Brutus and the conspirators made when they killed Caesar, right? They stabbed him with daggers. And when they pull the dagger out, the slit that it makes almost looks like a mouth. And the blood r- signifies the lips, right? So they are dumb mouths because they don't speak, but they do show you or they're trying to speak, but they're speaking in blood. So they tell all the witnesses to the, to the assassination that, I they to, that to, like I was murdered, right? I was assassinated. Here he's saying laughter out of dead bellies. Well, this this makes me think why laughter out of dead bellies? Because if the bellies are open, right? Let's say from a bayonet wound or from from a a, a particular violent trauma, right? And it makes a sort of a, a slit in the belly where all you're spilling your guts. You're literally spilling your guts. They're telling you, these dead men are telling you what has happened to them, right? Um, And he says, see at the end, um, that I love the part, a bitch, old bitch gone in the teeth for a botched civilization, a botched civilization. Um, I I don't even know if any words need to be spoken about that one. The botched civilization. Yes. For two gross of broken statues. How relevant is that? Yes. Broken statues for a few thousand battered books. Notice again that the alliteration there. He's what he's doing here is there's repetition in this poem, which reminds me of a Greek chorus. Some quick, some for, some from, some for, right? Um, never before, never before, never before. This is like a Greek chorus in a in, in a Greek tragedy or in an in a Homeric um, epic, and it's um, it 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 gives an epic context to the notion of war um, and, and how we always think of war, and we get this this sort of violent repetition in the poem, but it's also fragmentary. The poem is fragmentary uh, because there is a form and there is there is a form to this poem. But again, it's the contrast between form between the form, right, the form and the content that produces the meaning, the meat. And we just went over that. But he's saying here that basically um, I wrote a note here in the margin, the loss of form and fragmentation signifies um, it's almost like a fragment of parchment. A fragment of parchment recovered post-war. And this is like, um, if you've ever heard of, um, Sappho, the poet Sappho from the island of Lesbos. So she's a lesbian poet and all of her poems are, we get all of her poems in fragments because they're literally found on fragments of parchment that have, were recovered after they were burned or buried, etc. Um, and this is kind of what this poem is doing. It's saying like, there's the war, there's the destruction, there's the annihilation, and then here's the result. Here is the fragmentary, the thing that we get from it so that you will remember, right? But you won't remember because even when you read it, you'll do the same thing again, right? For a few thousand battered books. Okay, so let's move on from that to, um, let's see. 
We did Dulce, Dulce at Decor Mast. I thought we would move on to just a couple of other ones. I won't do a full analysis of the other ones uh, that I picked out necessarily. Um, before I do that, actually, I'm just going to read from the introduction to this book, um, which is – this is great. Uh, again, this is John Stallworthy, um, and he's talking about – what war poetry is, because I mentioned that in the beginning. So he says at the beginning here, poetry, Wordsworth reminds us, is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. We've discussed that before. Um, and there could be no area of human experience that has generated a wider range of powerful feelings than war. Hope and fear, exhilaration and humiliation, hatred, not only for the enemy, but also for generals, politicians and war profiteers. <laughs> wow. Okay. He's going to go for it right there. I forgot. I mean, I read this book years ago, this introduction, but um, sometimes these things hit you now, right? The war profiteers for fellow soldiers, for women and children left behind, for country often and cause occasionally. Man's early war songs and love songs were generally exhortations to action or celebration of action in one or other field, but no such similar similarity exists between what we now more broadly define as love poetry and war poetry. That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, no such similarity exists. However, we're going to see that, like, you can see that when you look into, especially medieval um, poems uh, or the poems of the of the Middle English era or especially the Victorian era, looking back on the medieval era, especially things like Tennyson, um, tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. We we tend to think of the poems reflecting this idea, this chivalric idea of love and war being intertwined, right? And you notice that um, in the chivalric uh, tradition, right, with knights and knights errant, when they're not at war, they are fighting for love. Um, but he says, this introduction says that there is no such similarity now. Um, he quotes here, uh, the Iliad, and he says, not that heroic societies were oblivious to the domestic consequences of their heroes, brain spattering, windpipe slitting art. It's the Iliad. Ends with Andromache, Andromache uh, watching from the walls of Troy as her husband's broken body is dragged away behind his killer's chariot. She mourned, and the women wailed in answer. Similarly, as the hero's funeral pyre is lit at the close of the old English epic, uh, written 1,500 years later, Beowulf, right? Um, his ancient wife with braided hair, grief-stricken, raised a song of lamentation for Beowulf. Repeatedly, she said that sore she dreaded evil days would come, much carnage, war's alarms, captivity, captivity and ignominy. Heaven swallowed up the smoke. Hers, however, is not the last word. That is spoken by Beowulf's warriors, his hearth companions. They say, it was their part to mourn, Bewail their king, recite an elegy, and acclaim the man. They praise his prowess and his mighty deeds. They fittingly extolled as right it is. A man should honor his kind lord in words. They said that of all earthly kings, he was gentlest of men and kindest unto all, to men most gracious and most keen for praise. He says, such societies recognize the cost of warfare, but the code to which they subscribed counted it as a necessary price for the pursuit of praise, honor, and renown. This was to be acquired by generosity and peace, mighty deeds in war, loyalty to the living, and loyalty to the dead. Um, what do you think about now? <laughs> right? Uh, later on, he says, the chivalric uh, tradition transmuted into the courtly tradition of the high renaissance required proficiency in the arts of war as well as in such peaceable arts as music and poetry. The courtier poet was expected to serve his king in much the same way as the Anglo-Saxon scop or shop um, took his, that's how I pronounce it, took his place in the shield wall with his lord. This is uh, basically the warrior poet, the warrior poet in the classic sense, right? The Earl of Surrey left, of Surrey left a moving elegy to his squire, Gascoigne, a rueful account of his capture and ransom, and Dunn condensed his experience of Cadiz into an epigram. He later says, um, let's see, uh, maybe be surprised by how rarely Renaissance poets write of war. Conventions had changed. Love had become the subject proper to a poet. On the rare occasion when the blast of war blows through a poem, it is likely to be the carefully orchestrated overture to a protestation of devotion. Okay, so isn't that true? You know, you, you hear... 
when we in the modern world, in the in the contemporary world, think of poets, right? We think of oh, all kinds of nonsense. We rarely think of war, right? However, this book shows us that some of the best poems are war, are war related, right? The lang I mean, war is like the crucible of human experience where we get all of the things, all of the actions, all of the emotions, all of the dread and the horror and the terror and the, the triumph. So, of course, you would think that the writers now would use that. Now, of course, movies use that and the movies are usually uh, completely co-opted co and propagandistic, right? Um, but we rarely get writers now discussing such things, yes? Yes. Okay, drinking my coffee. Just drinking my coffee. Just drinking my coffee. What's Michael Scott say in um, The Office? I don't want to work. I just want to tap on this mug all day. That's, we kind of all do that, right? Drinking my coffee. Drinking my coffee. What movie is that from? Drinking my coffee. Oh, it's, dude, it's Walter Sochak, right? It's Walter Sochak sitting at the coffee shop. Drinking my coffee. Just drinking my coffee. Why do you got to bring Nam into everything, Walter? I didn't watch my buddies die face down in the muck at Hill 364 at Lawn Dock just to watch some strumpet. Some fucked up, right? Okay, so later on he says, um, Cupid is an archer. Interesting. The besieging lover, having no shield proof against his darts, can only hope that his beloved... Uh, can only hope that his beloved in the spirit of Christian compassion will surrender. Right? We get this sort of martial image for love. That's an, that's that's pretty interesting. During the 18th century, soldiering, soldiering reached the low place in British society that it was hold until the Great War. An occupation despised by the middle and working classes as a disgrace, hardly less than prison. Um, is that true? What do you guys think about that? Right? Well, during the 18th century, I suppose. Okay, so at the, at, for some reason, I was thinking in the 19th century. Um, in the 18th century, soldiering reached the low place in the society that would hold until the Great War. I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Um, after all, we are dealing with the Enlightenment um, and the absolute uh, complete shift and change in society um, from the old traditions of order and hierarchy to the democratic and the demonic that occurs with things like the bloodbath in the French Revolution and um, certain groups that we can't say here that were formed in, let's say, 1776 that co-opted these things and have been a, an insidious force on society ever since. And we're still feeling that today. We all know this. So I'm not sure that in the media and in art, which they own, that these things are looked down upon. Um, maybe people think that they are looked down upon, right? This is kind of like the idea of <laughs> Saving Private Ryan is an anti-war movie. Um, yeah, okay. It's an anti-war movie if you watch it when you're 15 in 1995 or you are, uh, you know, you you maybe, remember, remember when Saving Private Ryan came out and they had all the guys, all the, the guys who went to see the movie that were like in D-Day and they were like walking out of the theater crying and all that stuff. Um, and, and uh, yeah, Natsuki. you know, and now um, go back and watch Saving Private Ryan. We've probably all seen it like a million times. Yeah, I saw it in the theater. We, have, we probably all saw it in the theater. And I remember like being transfixed by that movie and thinking this is so awesome. This movie is so awesome so realistic it's so gritty and they always told you this is an anti-war movie but go back and watch it is it an anti-war movie i don't think so i think it's a propaganda piece it's a pro movie in the a pro war movie in the sense that it's anti-war if you go against us it's pro war because we get to go and destroy the uh nameless um you know uh like humanoid creatures that they make the enemy into right in the movie. Um, if I, I would think that if it were anti-war, the movie would be like, okay, we're going to humanize everyone in the movie and show the futility of war. Right. But it doesn't do that. 
Um, instead, all the bad guys in the movie look exactly the same. They're all sort of nameless and they look like um, they're straight from the step, right? From the step or from, you know, from, from that, that country. Um, probably shouldn't name the country here, um, but from that place that we were fighting and they are dehumanized. Um, so you walk out of the movie going, hell yes. Now that may be true, right? Of course, of course that may be true. Yes. And we, you know, we, we, we want to win. We want a big, we want to win the big one. Yes. Yeah. 98 before a big nine. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, yeah, because Saving Private Ryan and, and the Thin Red Line came out the same year. And the, what do you guys think? I mean, I I prefer the Thin Red Line. The Thin Red Line is, I mean, they're completely different movies, which is weird because they were at the same time and the movies are set at the same time, except one's at, you know, Guadalcanal and one's in, in Europe. But the Thin Red Line is obviously, um, you see those vines everywhere, everywhere, Starls? Nature's cruel, Starls, right? Nick Nolte. Nature's cruel, Starls. See those vines? You see the way nature twists around everything? Starving it up? Suffocating it? What else, what else is he saying in the thin line? Uh, in the thin right line. Um, um, I see. I can't remember any lines from the movie. Um, I see you. Oh my God. It's a brilliant movie. It's a great movie. The Thin Red Line is an amazing movie, but of course that movie is much more impressionistic, right? Um, it's yeah. Terrence Malick. It's impressionistic. It's subjective. It's much more poetic. You know, we have long extended shots of nature, um, which is supposed to be like, we have that one shot of like, it touches the leaf and the leaf, you know, curls up, which is obviously a reflection of the fact that like man is sort of, going against nature by what he's doing in this war, destroying everyone. However, we also get the righteousness of the war in terms of the characters. Uh, we get the Jim uh, Caviezel character, right? Um, uh, who, who, you know, fights without a weapon and is simply there for his friends. And it, it becomes almost a mystical spiritual quest. Within it. I don't know. I don't know. What do you guys think? That's probably not a very good analysis of the movie, um, or at least I'm not saying it correctly. But, but um, yeah, it's a that's a great movie. Yeah, it's an epic movie. It's it's great. Um, God, I wish I could remember more lines in the movie. I used to quote that one all the time. I love that film. It's got, of course, it's oh, of course, it's got our favorite Sean Penn in the film, uh, who now plays again a role again IRL, right? <laughs> it's trying to do the same thing in. Uh, Ukraine that he did. Um, you remember, you guys remember um, the New Orleans 2005 event where Sean Penn went down there with uh, Blackwater and was like in canoes, armed, shooting looters or whatever. <laughs> that was, you know, he pops up a lot. And then we won't talk about what he did with um, a certain, a certain guy from a country south of us that got uh, that people say that he snitched on him right after the interview because that's when he got caught, but whatever. Um, tasty waves, bro. Okay. Uh, you dick, he says. So, let's see. Um, let's move on from there to let's see, the ten uh, Tennysonian perspective. Um, did we get to uh, Yates yet? We didn't get to Yates yet, so why don't we look at Yates? And for this one, I'm going to switch over here to okay. Just to show you, I um this book I didn't annotate at all because it's it's a it's a this was given to me by a um an AP teacher that I had in school. Um, and I've had this book. I carried this book with me for everywhere I've gone. I carried this book with me um to when I lived in Northern Ireland. And just to show you how long I've had this book, I just opened it up again and. Um, this, I had this as a bookmark in the book, <laughs> save $5 on your select PlayStation games. That's PlayStation one. You guys look NCAA football game, 98. There's 98 expires, 1998. Wow. I'm old. Um, uh, so let's read this poem from Yates. 
uh, which is kind of out of character, at least in my opinion. And this is an Irish airman foresees his death. This is page let's see, 58. But yeah, I don't want to write in this book because um, I wanted to keep it pristine. I didn't even notice how my, sometimes on my favorite books, my spine is, is I have to open the book very carefully. Okay. So this is an Irish airman foresees his death by William Butler Yeats. It's a short lyric poem, one stanza. And again, it's a World War I poem, but still um, common, uh, still relevant to today. And before I get into that, thank you all for being here. Thanks for dropping the links, everybody. Shout out to all the homies out there. And I know times are tight, uh, but it would help. And we can improve the stream if you could drop some fat super chats via <laughs> PayPal and Cash App, right? And in fact, if you do that, I will get a notification and I can read your questions or comments on here. And I would certainly appreciate it. And I love you guys. And I thank you for sharing the sharing those. Also, shout out to some of our friends out there. Obviously, always shout out to um, JD at jaysanalysis.com. Shout out to David Patrick Harry at Church of the Eternal Logos, who's been always kills it in streams. Um, high IQ. I learned so much from him. Shout out to our friend uh, Tristana, beautiful Tristana, Tristan Haggard at Primal Edge. Uh, I'm sorry. I just said the wrong thing because <laughs> one of the suggested things that came up was that last time it took my primal, primal edge health as primal rage, which is weird. Okay. So anyway, shout out to, forget I said that, shout out to beautiful Tristana at primal edge health. Okay. Um, and again, uh, continuous, brilliant. Hi, IQ streams and shout out to our friend Jerry at Exposing Powerful Lies and a Devotional Heart. Shout out to Rachel, the base homeschool mom, who did a great interview with um, Alex Stein last night on Conspiracy Castle. Um, thank you all out there. You guys are you guys are great for us. Yes, Tristana. And we love listening to you and um, and we would love to talk to you. We love we love to talk to anybody. Of course, I need you to drop some fat PayPals and cash apps so I can get some tech, so I can get some Streamlabs going, and then it'll be cool. So, all right, this is uh, an, Irish, an Irish Airman Foresees His Death by William Butler Yeats. This is going to be our last poem for the night. Um, he says, I know that I shall meet my fate somewhere among the clouds above. Those that I fight, I do not hate. Those that I guard, I do not love. My country is Kiltartan Cross. My countrymen kill Tartans poor. No likely end could bring them loss or leave them happier than before. Nor law, nor duty bade me fight, nor public men, nor cheering crowds. A lonely impulse of delight drove to this tumult in the clouds. I balanced all, brought all to mind. The years to come seemed waste of breath. A waste of breath the years behind, in balance with this life, this death. Okay, so let's see what we have to say about Yates here. Um, again, we have uh, let's see, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 16 line lyric poem. We have the adherence to form in this. We have the we have a rhyme scheme. We have a particular rhythm. Uh, we have uh, the idea of war as being ordered. But we have a couple of wacky things going on here. Now, the, the basic level sort of normie reading of this poem is, oh, well, it's obvious. He's saying war is bad. Um, and so, you know, I, we don't want war. Um, I guess maybe a level above that would be to say he doesn't like war and um, he is a nihilist, right? In balance with this life, this death. But I don't think that those are true. I think that Yeats's poem is another example of the sort of dialectic or the the maybe the the Gnostic idea, right, of life and death being co-equal, life force and death being co-equal, good and evil being co-equal in Yeats's view, where we do we do certainly get an, a sort of a nihilism in this. But let's look at it a little a little deeper, right? I know that I shall meet my fate. So it's again, it's this idea of fate. 
almost like the speaker here has no personal agency, right? He doesn't have free will, which is ironic because whenever in this, in literature, the, the, the character or the speaker says that they don't have any free will, um, they're always acting upon their free will to say that they are a playing into fate. Because in this poem, he made the decision to do these things. He's not just, it's not just fate. But he's saying here, I shall meet my fate somewhere in the clouds above. So obviously we get this idea of as above, so below, according to Yates, right? Those that I fight, I do not hate. Those that I guard, I do not love. So he's giving his reasons for being um, a pilot, right? We can say that he's an Irish airman. He's a pilot in the, I guess the, you know, the early RAF, World War, World War I era. And he says, his country is, Crispy, help me out on this, Kiltartan Cross, which to him is a, it's his village. It's his particular place where he lives. And he's saying that is his whole country. Now, in a sense, that is true for all of us, right? That our, our deepest connections and our, you know, patriotism is our loyalty to God and to our friends and family, right? But... He's saying here that his countrymen are killed Tartan's poor. He's from, he is one of these people. But then he says, no likely end, no likely end to the war could bring them loss or leave them happier than before, right? We get this yin yang, Yatesian, um, Gnostic idea of good and evil being co equal. Nothing that's going to happen. This is almost Nietzschean, right? Nothing that's going to happen um, is going to affect them. So why does he do it? nor law, nor duty bade me fight, right? No law pressed him into service. No sense of duty. Remember that we got in the in uh, the Ezra Pound poem and in the Wilfred Owen poem, the ideas about um, duty, right, and fighting. Yes, thank you, um, David says. David says, uh, conversation about poetry with Brother Augustine would be interesting. Yeah, Wickoff is awesome. Shout out to Brother Augustine Wickoff out there, Michael Wickoff, Brother Augustine. Um, love listening to him um, for a long time. I first heard him um, uh, through through Jay, um, and they were talking about uh, they were talking about like Hermeticism and Blake, and that was that was like October 2020, I think. Um, and I always love listening to him. He's a uh, high IQ, always has. Um, really good and base takes on literature and on art and on, uh, on a, and just in a wide range of stuff. So I, yeah, he's great. I love him. Shout out to uh, brother Augustine, uh, very high IQ. I love his demeanor too. He's always calm um, and, and put together and um, is just a, a sophisticated dude. Yeah. I like him a lot. So, um, so let's get back to Yates here. He says, a lonely impulse of delight drove to a lonely impulse, a lonely impulse of delight, right? That's it. He was impulsive. He's living according to his senses. Yes. He felt like doing it. So he did it. What's this? I balanced all brought all to mind. Okay. So yeah, again, the basic normie level analysis of this poem is, oh, he's just balancing things, right? Or we think of, you know, the force and the dark side. But we know that this is an allegory for uh, the thing that they always do in movies and in literature, which is the Gnostic quest, right? And he's saying here, the years to come seemed waste of breath, a waste of breath, the years behind. His whole life has been a waste and will always be a waste in balance with this life, this death. Interesting. Now, what he does clever here in the poem, uh, wh what he does cleverly in the poem is the idea of the balance is supposed to, remember, great poetry will show and not tell. The idea of the balance is, makes me think of, you know, the airplane. He's a pilot and he's balancing his wings, right? He's balancing his, his control board. He's balancing on the wind, right? And he can't go one way or the other unless he wants to go in a specific direction. He's also balancing, he's balancing the plane in every way. He's also balancing his decisions in terms of, 
where he's going to fly, who he's going to shoot, how he's going to hide, how he's going to move, how he's going to maneuver. But we know that this balance. Now, look, maybe the maybe we can give the pilot a little bit of, you know, he's in the middle of a war. So he's let's say he's gone through some traumatic experiences, obviously, you know, in the war. And he's saying that, you know, he's saying to himself, nothing else matters. That's what we can read into it. Right. From the point of view of the speaker. But the guy is alive. Because he's he he's speaking in this poem. Right. And if life and death are meaningless, what is he doing alive? Right. What's he doing? What, he's just living according to like his evolutionary biology? Well, he, he if that's true, then why is he contemplating it, right? What's his truth? What's his, obje- what's his sense of objective truth? Is it just he's just this dumb beast living according to the senses? I don't know. I mean, I think that I think that it's a dark it's a dark poem. And it this sort of poem appeals to people in a number of incorrect ways. And I think that the poem is, yes, it's true in the sense of it is a war poem, right? We get this obvious sense of violence and darkness because it's a war poem, just like we do with all war poems. But when you start getting into philosophy and spirituality and religion and the ideas of, you know, being and nothingness and future and past, it becomes something else. And it seems to be you know, with Yeats, another example of the poem reads to me, I've always found it eerie and weird. It's like a spell, right? It's like an, it's like an occult spell um, because it's, it's strange. It's bizarre. You're expecting more. You're expecting more. Now that's not a, 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 you know, a a slight against the poem. It's, it's one of the, you know, it's in the canon. Um, However, what is this, right? What is this? Um, And I think that this is, again, relevant to what's going on today. Anyway, I just wanted to end that. And with that, um, I had a couple of other things um, I could dip into, but I think that'll probably do it. Um, Maybe I'll read I'll read one more just to end it. Um, This is another Ezra Pound poem, and this is from uh, from his book, Persona. And I'm just reading from. a book, an old book by XJ, uh, Western Wind, which I got when I was in AP Lit. But um, it's just got a good example of the text right here. So, so Yeats, I mean, sorry, uh, Ezra Pound and his discussions about poetry and, and what is poetry and turning into free verse. He said that poems, um, one of the principles of new poetry was to compose in the sequence of the musical phrase, not in the sequence of a metronome. So what that means is kind of what we talked about at the beginning, just to bring this back to the beginning um, in terms of literature and that, and that uh, rhymed verse kind of became this da, 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 da. It's formulaic. And so it sort of starts to sound with the rhythm and like a, like a metronome, it's metronomic. But he said that verse should be uh, composed in the sequence of a musical unit, right? Because when you think of lyric poetry and its origins in in Greece, right, it's lyric because it's played on the lyre, the instrument. Yes, it's meant to be sung. So this poem is uh, an ancient sounding poem. It's meant to reflect uh, Pound's interest in um, Provence and the Languedoc poets and the, um, especially what's his name, Francois Villon, and it's also it also reminds me of Beowulf a lot. It's like a this is like an Anglo-Saxon war poem, and it's called The Return. It's it's pretty famous. It's one of my favorite favorite poems. Really short. So it's called The Return. He says, "See they return. Ah, see the tentative movements and the slow feet, the trouble in the pace and the uncertain wavering. See they return one, and by one with fear as half awakened." as if the snow should hesitate and murmur in the wind and half turn back. These were the winged withal, inviolable, gods of the winged shoe, with them the silver hounds sniffing the trace of air. Hi, hi, these were the swift to harry, 
These, the keen scented, these were the souls of blood, slow on the leash, pallid, the leash men. Um, uh, it says in the in this little book I have here, I'll just read directly from this. It says, here are the diffidence of the ghostly figures once alive, once so alive, finds its equivalent in the hesitating cadence, which owes much to the ancient rhythms that Powell knew so well. The rising rhythm of they return is immediately reversed, refracted in the falling rhythm of see the tentative movement, which is followed by the dragging and the slow feet. The rest of the poem is basically iambic, but um, the poem again plays into the sense of rhythm and a loss of form in the midst of chaos, of the chaos of war, but then a return to form and a return to order. So anyway, I just wanted to end with that. I think that's a pretty good place to end. We had a good discussion today. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much again to everybody who's here and to all my wonderful mods, right? All my buddies, my homies. Thank you again for dropping the links for me. Um, if you uh, got an extra buck or so to spare, yo, go ahead and drop me at cash at Bayes Lit Analyzer. That's me. That's me, right? Drop me a cash app or a PayPal. Help me get some, help me get some tech here. And in the meantime, I will see you guys soon. Go subscribe to all of our friends, read some books, um, stay, uh, stay dialed in everybody. Try not to freak out about everything happening. Um, I know none of us are, but you know, I don't know about you guys, but I've answered IRL. I've answered um, the same questions about the events going on right now, probably 40 times in the last three days from different people, texting, phone calls, um, coming up to me in person and saying, yo, what's the deal with what's happening over there? Um, can you tell me about it? And like, they just want to know. And you know, that's good. That's good. They want to know like what's happening. That's great. And it's, and it, it feels great to be, you know, to, to be consulted on stuff like that in our lives. Right. Um, but it is exhausting. It's exhausting having to explain this stuff all the time to the same people. So shout out to you guys. I'm sure you guys are doing that in your real life. Um, and yeah, shout out, shout out to the Shankle, shout, shout, shout out to the Shankle boys out there. Crispy shout out to our Sandy rule. And, um, you guys, thank you. Stay healthy. I love you. And I will see, see you soon. So peace, peace to you guys. God bless. Peace, everybody. Love you.